it on levels in your home. Home is a place to live, love, and laugh, not a place to breathe air containing radon. The Berkeley and Morgan County Health Departments are distributing free confidential radon test kits, and you can get yours at the Berkeley County Health Department office in Martinsburg and the Morgan County Health Department office in Berkeley Springs. Protect your home and family. Get your free radon test kit today. Hello and welcome to our Talk Radio WRNR TV 10 Stubblefield Institute Candidate Forum. Rob Mario here along with my colleagues, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Bill, thank you for being here today. Thank you very much, Rob. Looking forward to it. New York Times bestselling author, co-host John Gilstrap. Good John, morning. Great to have you here. We are uh, going to start with the candidates for governor in the state of West Virginia and uh, the rules that everybody has agreed to ahead of time. We'll get a maximum of two minutes for a uh, opening statement. Two minutes for a closing statement toward the end of this hour. We'll take a break in between. And we're asking the candidates to limit their answers to about two minutes uh, maximum. We'll cover four different categories today. Education, economic development, health and family services. And then the final category will be individual priorities. We will alternate questions between Bill and John and take a break halfway through. We'll start first with opening statements. And in order from my left, Secretary Mac Warner will go first. Secretary Thank Warner. Thank you very much. And, uh, folks, I'm Mac Warner, uh, current Secretary of State and running for governor. I was born and raised in West Virginia. I love West Virginia. Um, I was raised in public schools in Charleston, uh, became an Eagle Scout there, and then was accepted to the United States Military Academy at West Point. That's the number one leadership school in the world. And following that, I had a career in the military. And the military uh, is all about service, service to others. Uh, it's about solving large problems. When the country has a large problem to solve, it calls on its U.S. military. Um, it has a way of going about accomplishing the large challenges or tasks. And uh, that's been ingrained in me from uh, day one. Also, I mentioned the military because the governor's the commander in chief of the West Virginia National Guard, the best National Guard in the nation and has to know when uh, to deploy the National Guard and its uh, left and right boundaries. Uh, I served a uh, career in the military, mostly as a JAG officer, uh, a lawyer. So I've been trained to look at both sides. And when you look at today's issues, things like vaccinations has been a big deal here in West Virginia. There are two good sides to that. The abortion, there's, there's sides on that. You have to be able to look, look and analyze problems uh, from, from all sides. I was a teacher there. I taught at the Army's uh, law school. Uh, so I understand what a teacher goes through. Most importantly, though, is I have a wonderful family. I have a wonderful wife, Debbie, that we've been married for 41 years, uh, raised four uh, fantastic ch children, have two sons in law, all of whom have served in the military. Uh, part of the military is team building. I am a person who can unite this party. Uh, there's some good candidates in this race, uh, but we've got to be able to pull this party together and win this election uh, come November. Again, my name is Mac Warner, and I'm asking for everyone's vote. Thank you. Secretary of State Mac Warner. And now with uh, our second candidate for governor here in attendance at our forum, former Judiciary Chairman in the House of Delegates, Moore Capito. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, I'm Moore Capito. I am a lifelong West Virginian, sixth generation, and the father of two young kids. I'm the get-it-done conservative uh, running for governor. And the future of this state is personal to me and it's personal to so many West Virginians for their own reason. And throughout this campaign, we have traveled over 85,000 miles, crisscrossing the state in every single community multiple times. And the reason that we've done that is so that we can take as much time as possible to listen to every single West Virginian. I can tell you that it is great to be back in the Eastern Panhandle. We have spent a lot of time here, and every time that we visit the Eastern Panhandle. It is an invigorating experience uh, because of the energy uh, and the growth that is going on right here in the Eastern Panhandle. I know that oftentimes when we look to different parts of the state uh, that are seeing uh, excitement and growth, we do certainly look uh, to the Eastern Panhandle. I'm proud to be the candidate in this race that has uh, lowered the personal income tax. I'm proud to be the candidate in this race that's spread school choice, uh, that's provided teachers with pay increases. I'm also proud that as the Judiciary Chairman 
uh, that I led in passing the most conservative agenda in the history of the state of West Virginia. We have a real opportunity uh, in 2024 to take West Virginia to the next level, uh, and I would be honored to have your trust, and I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be in the EP. Former Judiciary Chairman Moore Capito, and now West Virginia businessman Chris Miller. So my name is Chris Miller, and I'm a business guy. I'm not a politician. Um, when I was 10 and a half years old, I told my dad I wanted a pair of Air Jordan tennis shoes. When he found out they cost $125, you know what he told me? Get a job. And I've been working ever since. Eventually, I got involved in our family's business. And when I got involved, we had two. And through a lot of hard work and blood, sweat, and tears, I was able to turn that into 26 different enterprises. We've got 700 employees, 500 of which are right here inside of the state of West Virginia. And if I ran my businesses the way the government spends our tax dollars, I'd be broke. More importantly, as a business guy, we know capital flows like water to the places that it's most welcome. And West Virginia has an incredible opportunity in front of it. We just make, need to make ourselves more open to capital. First thing we need to do is get rid of the state income tax completely, because three of the four fastest growing states post-pandemic, Tennessee, Texas, and Florida, all have a zero state income tax. Also, we're moving into a time where we need less politicians, less bureaucrats, and less attorneys running things, and more business guys running things, because we understand risk, we sign the front of a paycheck, we understand urgency, and we know how to get stuff done. That's why I'm running for governor of West Virginia, because our state has an incredible opportunity in front of it, and I don't want to leave it up to politicians. We need our best and our brightest on the field, and we need more business people involved in running state government, because state government should be run more like a business. Businessman Chris Miller, thank you very much. And to all three of our candidates, uh, each of the three of you is a good distance from the Eastern Panhandle. Let me, on behalf of our audience, thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule to be here for this candidate forum for the most important office of governor. Now, with the first round of our questions and the subject of education, John Gilstrap. Good morning, gentlemen. <clears throat> Since Mac, you went first with the introductions, I will turn to uh, Delegate Capito for uh, the first question on education. The way we're doing this, we're going to ask the same question to each of you. All right. Uh, while per capita uh, capital spending, excuse me, while per capita student spending falls in the mid-range among the 50 states, student performance, by virtually all measurements, hovers at the bottom here in West Virginia. What is the root of this problem? And what would you do to correct it? Well, number one, I think uh, we've taken uh, steps in the legislature to do that. And I was proud to lead in, in putting forward the Third Grade Success Act uh, that we passed last year in the legislature to ensure that we're getting supplemental reading help in every first, second, and third grade classroom. Uh, here in West Virginia, we know that kids, you know, learn to read uh, from birth to third grade, and then they, are, you know, they read to learn from third grade on. That's a critically important metric that all of the data bear uh, as a success metric. We know that exponential success comes when kids are reading uh, in the third grade. So that's just uh, one step. But uh, just last week, I was very proud to release our A-plus for West Virginia education plan that talks about growing um, our population of teachers in West Virginia. I mean, when we look in the Eastern Panhandle, that's critically important. It's tough to recruit and retain teachers here because of the pay differential that we see among other states. That's something that we clearly need to address uh, throughout West Virginia. Class size is becoming an issue because we don't give enough individual attention uh, to students. But I think the real opportunity in the centerpiece that I talk about in our education plan is our West Virginia Ready program that ensures that every uh, high school senior in the state of West Virginia will graduate and be able to either go on to the military uh, have a workable vocational trade skill or be able to go on to college. And I firmly believe the more opportunities and more pathways that we provide our students, the chances for success are going to be higher. We've often talked about just one pathway for far too long. Kids have just been told to go to college and it's not working. We need to provide them with opportunities to involve themselves in the community right after high school and become uh, productive citizens. I can tell you I visited with a lot of our vocational and trade schools throughout the state, including Blue Ridge here for an entire day. And these are the opportunities that are going to allow us to build a workforce um, in West Virginia. We know we have a workforce participation shortage, and that's the way that we backfill that. So my wife's a teacher. She's taught public school and private school, and education has been a part of Pillow Talk for the past 20 years in my household. 
it is a problem in West Virginia. Um, we know the Eastern Panhandle has some own unique issues there. Um, we've got a locale pay issue up here that needs to get addressed. Also, if you look at the structure of education in West Virginia, we have this big bloated bureaucracy at the top that soaks up all of the resources with six-figure jobs. Bureaucrats in West Virginia, a part of the Department of Education, make more than a teacher. That's a major discrepancy. Discrepancy. We have a teacher shortage as well. We need to be able to pay our teachers more. We need to clean up the bureaucracy and take the resources and make sure they flow into the classroom to make sure the teachers are paid more and also to make sure that the resources go to the taxpayer, who is the student and the parent. We structure it the right way. Like you guys said earlier, we're in the top 18 in dollars spent per kid in the country in education. We have the resources. The problem is the structure. It's the big blood of bureaucracy. We're getting in the way of letting teachers actually teach, and we need to make sure and pay them more because there's a shortage for teachers. Now, also, there's a major issue when it comes to how we're educating kids. One, they're not getting enough physical exercise at all. They've got all of the, they're bombarded with technology, with all this social media and stuff, and they're struggling. They're hurting. One of the other things I think we ought to be doing statewide is we need to have a chapel and a chaplain inside of every single high school in West Virginia because kids around the state are really hurting, and there needs to be an option for them to go to to be able to get some of the stuff that's in their heart out. Lastly, in order to make sure and take care of results when it comes to paying our teachers more, we need to also recruit outside of the state to bring more teachers in because there is a major shortage. We do all those things right there. West Virginia can address its education issues and take off with education. But we need to also make sure that we're getting kids education when it comes to trades because we convinced an entire group of kids to go off to college. They got degrees in art history. Now they're strapped with student debt living in their parents' basement. We need to teach people how to do stuff once again, and we need to expand our trade and vocational education in West Virginia. Thank you, Chris Miller. John, could you restate the question again to Secretary Warner? While per capita student spending falls in the mid-range among the 50 states, student performance by virtually all measurements here in West Virginia hovers at the bottom. What is the root of this problem, and how would, what would you do to correct it? The root of the problem is the teacher shortage. We have a, between 1,000 and 1,500 openings for teachers, and so we do have to – focus on the teachers, but there are three legs to the stool of education. It's teachers, parents, and it's students, and we always have to continue to focus on the students. The money should follow the students. We have to involve the teacher or the, the parents in uh, deciding what the proper curriculum is, but I want to go back to the teachers for just a minute. The teachers has to be the focus, so it's not when we talk about this budget surplus in the state, it really irritates me because when you shouldn't have a surplus and brag about that the same time you have a teacher shortage or correction shortages and so on so the teacher focus on the teachers is essential otherwise if you don't have teachers in the in the classroom you're simply warehousing those children and so we have to have the teachers in there but they have to be qualified teachers certifications are important because they are the ones that you challenge a, a, a child's imagination know how to know at what level you can present certain materials and so on so that focus on teachers we have to address the discipline problem uh, the teachers, I've been to a number of high schools, and it's amazing to me. One after another, they said the number one problem is vaping. Who would have thought that? But they, Because of the little cartridges you can slip in there, take a puff of THC, uh, you can't learn when you're high on something. So discipline is a big issue, it, but it's back to the priorities of the, the teachers and uh, making sure that we have enough of them in the classroom to challenge the, the children. I was in Finland not long ago, one of the top uh, countries in the world in education, and I've got some wonderful ideas I'd like to share with you later on that. Thank you. Thank you, right. Secretary Warner. Uh, John, question number two. All right. <clears throat> Starting with Mr. Miller. Do you support the State Board of Education in its current configuration and scope of control? And if changes are needed, what would you propose to put in its place? From a funding standpoint, our bureaucracies, including the State Board of Education, soak up way too many resources that, make, that stop it from flowing into the classroom to pay our teachers more and to make sure the resources go to the taxpayer which is all of us in this room, everybody out there listening, and everybody else around the state. And this should be about making sure that taxpayers have return on investment for their tax dollars. As well, we need to bring it back down to localized control. We need to make sure that people on the ground that know the kids have more say in what's happening with their own education. It shouldn't come from the federal government and then the state government forcing all this wokeism into our school systems because that's what's happening. So we need to kick the wokeism out of the school systems and make sure and bring the focus back to localized control where people have the flexibility to decide how their dollars are spent and how their kids are being educated. All right. Secretary, Secretary Warner. Ditto. Man, he nailed it. <laughs> that, that was beautiful, okay? Uh, you've got to focus on that local control. That's that We have to do that. I, I would propose to your listeners that there's no more important election than the Board of Education because we've got to solve this education problem. 
uh, in West Virginia, and it starts at the local level. I talked about the parents being involved. We need good people running for the Board of Education and address the uh, the curricula, uh, the the issues, the discipline, all that sort of thing, right there from the uh, uh, from the local level. So, um, excuse me. What about the state Board of Education? Again, we we need to get the right people in there and make sure that. Uh, just like Chris said, we we shouldn't be taking the direction from the federal government and pushing this down on the uh, local level. So uh, I just uh, can't emphasize enough the importance of the right people in the right positions and distributing that money, making sure it's down at the the local level and not being soaked up by a top-heavy administration. Sure. Chairman Capito. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, there's no question that the State Board of Education has gotten overly bloated. And here's the really the big problem that we talked about a lot in the legislature, was that there's zero accountability. The State Board of Education is sort of this other arm of government that is not, it does not answer to the people. And I was very proud to try to put through legislation that made it so that every rule that the Department of Education put down could be reviewed by the legislature, so then the legislature could actually have some oversight on some of that rulemaking. The reason for that is because ultimately the people should have a say on what is going on in the classroom. And by the people, I mean mostly parents. Parents ought to know what's going on in the classroom and with their children, and there's zero accountability right now. Uh, so, you know, we have to make sure, as I've said, I've traveled over 85,000 miles uh, across this state and visited with a lot of teachers, a lot of parents, a lot of faith leaders um, and boards. And we need to make sure that we, as it was said, localize uh, our curriculum, localize and tailor what is being taught in the classroom. One size does not fit all in West Virginia, and boy do we know that. We got a lot in common from a value set. But, but some of the challenges that we face regionally are very regional. Uh, and so we need to make sure, again, that we're listening to those local leaders. And as your governor, I will do exactly like I'm doing on this campaign, and I will run in the communities and with the people because I believe that the solutions are on the ground. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we move on to the subject of economic development, business, and such. Bill Stubblefield. Bill? Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, the Eastern Panhandle is the most aggressive growth area in the state. What would you do to sustain this growth? I thank Mr. Secretary, it's your turn. And let's try to limit our answers to 90 seconds in this round. Sure. The key in economic development is working with the local economic development uh, councils. And, um, the, I, I don't want to see money going to companies to try to bring them here. I want to see money going to the infrastructure. So I'm talking roadways, water, sewer, in, uh, Internet, broadband. We need to make sure that that is uh, applicable all across uh, the state. But here in the eastern panhandle, you've got some great examples, Procter & Gamble and uh, those sorts of things, working with the, the local uh, uh, community college and so on. That is the model. But uh, any company that's going to come here, I want to hear what they're going to do for education. What are they going to do? How are they going to partner with the local uh, schools to, to improve the previous set of questions that we were talking on? So I want to put the money into the ground once it's in the ground, not just site ready, but footer ready. So. Then the companies can, can compete, and then the regional economic development councils can say, here's what we have available and, and come, not putting money into that company, because the problem with that is that company can then sell out and take the money that the state has given to them. So I think West Virginia's turned the corner in being business friendly and attracting businesses. You've seen all the announcements over the last few years. We want to continue that, but the way that the state spends its money should be changed to putting money into the ground, not into the companies. Mr. Capito. Yeah, so several things. I think that uh, we need to continue to lower our personal income tax. Uh, again, we've, we've cut the personal income tax. I was very proud to support that. We need to accelerate uh, that so that we can completely get rid of the income tax. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, certainly infrastructure. When we look at some of the choke points, particularly here in the eastern panhandle, whether it's on exit 12, I know there was an, uh, an announcement here recently by the governor to you know, help alleviate some of that along Route 9 between Martinsburg and Hedgesville. Those are critically important infrastructure projects. Uh, when we look at you know, flowing traffic, that's a very big deal. Water and sewage, do we have enough water and sewage to sustain growth? When you look at companies that come in like Procter & Gamble and Clorox and some of these companies that are employing a lot of people, 
we need to not only make sure that our assets in place are able to sustain what the demand is currently, but is able to sustain growth because that's really what we all want. Infrastructure, of course, means more than just roads and water and sewage. It means you know broadband and bridges and all of those things. Uh, another issue that doesn't really get talked about a lot is housing. Um, I was very, uh, I, I can't tell you how impressed I was with what's going on over at Interwoven Mills. I took a uh, tour of that a few months ago. The housing opportunities that are uh, becoming available there are incredibly important to growth in the Eastern Panhandle. And lastly, and maybe even most importantly, is workforce development. Uh, when we went to Blue Ridge, we had a lot of that conversation in the partnerships that are being created with Procter & Gamble right now are critically important to making sure that jobs are available and workers are trained. Thank you. Mr. Miller, do you need the question repeated? No. Okay. So we're going to run state government more like a business. And in business, we know speed kills. And right now, we have a growth problem up here in the Eastern Panhandle, but it's also around the rest of the state. We have to be faster when it comes to permitting, our efficiency, making sure the infrastructure is where it needs to go, and lastly, where the tax dollars need to go. Because the Eastern Panhandle is going to be a, you know, one of the saviors of the state of West Virginia, and we have to make sure that it has all the infrastructure and all the ability to grow at the right speed at the right time to be able to get that job done. The state's got a fiscal cliff coming. If we don't add 200,000 people to the state over the next 10 to 12 years, there's a financial catastrophe. How do you do that? You run state government like a business, you realize that capital flows like water to the places that it's most welcome. You get rid of the income tax, you get rid of some of the other taxes that are inhibited to growth, then you start running things quickly and fastly, and you handle all of the infrastructure needs by paying attention. You have to do that. We're not doing that at all right now, and the Eastern Panhandle has an incredible opportunity in front of it. There's some other things we need to do, need to do as well. We have a major opportunity when it comes to energy in our state. West Virginia has an incredible amount of coal, natural gas, more water than anybody else. We also, according to the Department of Energy, are the hotbed for geothermal power production in the entire world. We can produce more power with geothermal heat than Saudi Arabia can generate in BTUs and natural gas. When you add all that stuff up, we can reduce the cost of power in West Virginia by almost 70% and use that for the foundation of a lot of our economic growth and development because people have to have power. Businesses have to have power in an age where it keeps going up in cost. You cut power by 70%, you've done something impactful as well for Jim and Susie Adkins, 70 years old, retired and on Social Security, you cut their power bill by 70%, that's a game changer for them too. Okay. Question number two, Bill. Okay, and this will start with uh, uh, Chairman Capito. Uh, Pacific Industry, do you support the legislation that brought form energy to West Virginia, and why or why not? We have to look at every single deal that comes into the state of West Virginia from an economic perspective, and I think, you know, Governor Justice and his team have done that. Um, we have to look at what are the specifics of the deal, what are the jobs being created, you know, I was just in the northern panhandle meeting uh, with the folks at Cleveland Cliffs. Um, it's the last 900 workers of a steel industry that at one time was 13,000 workers uh, that not only made up a community, uh, but was a lifeblood of a region. And so when we look at uh, what the regional needs are and where the opportunities are, I think we have to take each deal as it comes. And we have to evaluate the merits. Uh, of the deal and to make sure that West Virginia is getting the best benefit of the deal. So um, every deal that comes on my desk, we will look at it uh, through the lens of how it benefits West Virginia. We need to recruit companies uh, to West Virginia, and as your governor, I will always do that. Mr. Miller. You know who's really, really bad at negotiating? Politicians. You know who's really, really good at negotiating? Business guys. There was a lot of meat left on that bone when it came to that deal. It's not the right deal for West Virginia. We're talking about a company that doesn't have the same values and the same outlook on the world as we do, and we left a lot of meat on that bone. That was not a good deal for West Virginia. I've seen it time and time again where we get something that we think is a good idea, and we don't pay attention to all the details or why they're here, and we literally give away the house because we're not good at negotiating. West Virginia has what everybody is looking for right now. Not only are we geographically located, a stone's throw away from two-thirds of the population, but we have all of the resources the rest of the world needs. Like I mentioned earlier, coal, natural gas, water, geothermal power production, rare earth elements right here in the state. More and more businesses are going to come to us to try to cut deals to get themselves injected inside of our state, and we need to make sure and do a better job of that because we leave a lot of meat on the bone. We really do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you need the question um, repeated? No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to combine those two answers. 
uh, I think they both had a, a part of the right, the right answer on that. Um, this was a particular company coming in at a particular time, and Weirton was hurting, and Weirton wanted it, and the representatives there wanted it. Um, but the, and, and the state was in that process of changing to, to tell the world we are business ready. We are ready for large businesses like yours to come. But then the state offered up millions of dollars to bring that company here. And that's one I was referring to earlier about we just don't want to give money to companies. We want to put the investment into the ground and then have companies compete for that footer ready uh, project. So I think uh, Moore was in the area of it was a particular company at a particular time. Governor Justice and the legislature uh, voted to do that. And, and I'm going to be one that is working with the legislature, okay? We have some experts from all over the state, 100 uh, delegates, 34 senators, all representing not only the geographic parts of the state, but the uh, different aspects, of the, the teachers, uh, lawyers, uh, business people, also doctors, okay? So I we need to be listening to them, all right? But when that president said that he was coming in here and was going to put coal companies out of business, that sort of thing, that that's what they were designed to do, that was not the right message, and so I think we all need to take a step back and reevaluate the next time a form energy tries to come to West Virginia. John, John, thank you very much. That concludes the first half of our candidate forum for the three candidates for governor who are here with us today. We'll take this time out and be right back with uh, John and examine health and family services as our next subject. Stay right where you are. Don't go away. Do you have someone in a nursing home? Or are you worried about somebody you love going into a nursing home? The law firm of Daniel Staggers can protect your assets. Call the law firm of Daniel Staggers today at 304-267-3915. The Daniel Staggers law firm does elder care law, estate planning, and special needs trusts for disabled children and family members. Visit the Daniel Staggers law firm for your initial free consultation at 133 East John Street in Martinsburg. The Daniel Staggers law firm, when you need asset protection for you or for a family member. The WVU Heart and Vascular Institute is pleased to announce that thoracic surgery with Dr. Shalini Reddy is now available in Martinsburg at WVU Medicine Berkeley Medical Center. Dr. Reddy has practiced thoracic surgery in the region for over eight years and offers robotic laparoscopic surgeries for the lungs, esophagus, and more. For more information about thoracic surgery in Martinsburg, check us out online at mywvuheart.com. I'm Eric Householder and I'm running for state auditor because it's time to end fraud and corruption in West Virginia. My record shows I will stand up and fight for taxpayers. I've led the way to historic tax reform, smaller government, defending the Second Amendment, protecting the right to life, and providing school choice to West Virginians. Taxpayers deserve a government that works for them, not red tape and corruption. I have a message for those who steal from the taxpayer. West Virginia has had enough. I'm Eric Householder, I'm running for state auditor, and I would appreciate your vote. Panhandle Printing and Design is your full-service local print shop. With over 50 years of combined experience, we know how to handle all of your printing and design needs. We can handle anything, from small business cards to wrapping large vehicles. Our in-house design team can do it all. As a staple of this community, we love helping people promote their events, businesses, and anything they're passionate about. Envision, create, and bring your ideas to life with Panhandle Printing and Design. The future doesn't wait. Why should you? Blue Ridge Community and Technical College offers over 60 degree and certificate programs in education, IT, culinary arts, engineering, and so much more. Small class sizes, flexible schedules with evening and online classes, affordable tuition, plus financial aid is available to those who qualify. Now you can go to college. Visit us online at blueridgectc.edu. That's blueridgectc.edu. Stop waiting and enroll today. Meet Paul Espinosa, a dedicated servant to our values and future. Espinosa spearheaded one of the nation's most powerful pro-life laws, protecting the innocent and upholding our values. Under his leadership, West Virginia saw the largest tax cut in its history and the elimination of the state tax on Social Security benefits. Paul has been a champion for student-centered education, helping ensure parents and students have the freedom to choose their own path. For a brighter future, vote Paul Espinosa. Paid for by Espinosa for Senate, Mary C. Espinosa, Treasurer. 
with four new car dealerships and four used car dealerships in three states. Parsons is the largest used car and fastest growing new car dealer in the tri-state area. Take Parsons Ford with huge savings on hundreds of new Fords. Financing from 0%. Parsons' goal of financing for all. And Parsons' famous above market trade-in allowances that help make Parsons number one for used cars too. See why so many won't buy anywhere but Parsons Ford in Martinsburg. We became number one by making you number one first. Parsons. Our southern border is in chaos. Illegal immigration, rising crime, and unsafe elections. This is Joe Biden's America. Hi, I'm Doug Scaff, Republican, running for Secretary of State. I'll secure our elections, create more jobs, and defeat Biden's radical agenda. West Virginia needs Republican Doug Scaff as Secretary of State to defend our West Virginia values. I'm asking you to vote for me, Doug Scaff, for Secretary of State. Finally, West Virginia is moving in the right direction. As your West Virginia Senate President, Craig Blair has passed the most conservative legislative agenda in the nation. He has fought for our values like banning elective abortions, protecting our Second Amendment rights, and prevented boys from playing in girls' sports. Senator Craig Blair championed the largest tax cut in the history of our state. Craig Blair, a strong conservative leader, promises made, promises kept. This election, vote for Republican Craig Blair for State Senate. Paid for by the committee to re-elect Craig Blair. Talk Radio WRNR and TV 10 is your home for high school baseball and softball. The pitch from four, lined in the left field, that's down for a base hit. French is rounding third, and the Eagles walk it off and win the Region 2 Section 1 Championship over Musselman on the lane to water walk-off single. Join us all season long for coverage of every EPAC team right here on Talk Radio WRNR and TV 10. John Gilstrap will lead off our second round of questions now on the subject of health and uh, family services. We have our three governor here with us today. John? Good morning, and we'll start with Chris. West Virginia is third in the nation in percentage of child abuse and neglect cases. What would you do to address this crisis? Oh, my gosh. So we have a dilapidated foster care system. We've got 7,000 kids in our foster care system right now as well. That's almost three times as many as it ever has been. We also, 2017 and 2018 were the peak of the opiate epidemic. More kids were born addicted to opiates during that time frame than any other time in human history. And they're now turning six and seven years old and they're moving into our first grade system and we're not prepared for them. It's bigger than that. There's an abuse issue. There's an, there's a, uh, an opiate issue where you've got kids that are addicted to opiates now moving into the school system and the teachers aren't ready for it. And there's an incredible amount of foster care that has major issues. The way to do this is you have to have funding for it all. And like I said, we do have major issues when it comes to the ability of West Virginia's economy to grow in the future if we don't act right now. We have to create an economy that thrives to make sure that we have the economic growth to substantiate the resources that we need to care for all of this stuff. Now, we are operating on a little bit of a surplus right now, so we need to take a little bit more of that money to direct it to those systems to make sure that they're taken care of. But if we don't start acting right now, we're going to lose an entire generation of kids. It's going to be a very, very scary thing. Then it compiled with the pandemic and what we saw with mental health. So it's not just that. There's kids, there's kids in everyday school that are struggling right now with mental health issues. We have to change how we're doing things. We need to bring, like, we need to bring activity back into the school systems. We need to bring Christianity back into the school systems. We need to make sure and have our teachers prepared to be able to handle what's coming. There's major problems. There really are. And we got to make sure the resources go to protect our kids because that is a challenge. Secretary Warner. We go right back to education. We have to solve this education process. And so right now, there's as many as one in five or one in six children who are not being raised by their parents or being raised by grandparents or in the foster care system. And we have to solve the education problem starting at the earliest ages. I'm not talking about one through three or even kindergarten. I'm talking pre-K, birth to three. All right, we have to be looking at that entire spectrum and solve things like early childhood education, the uh, child care situation. We need to provide affordable and accessible child care throughout the state. There's this formula right now where the uh, child care uh, businesses are uh, being compensated from the state on an attendance basis, but it should be on an enrollment basis. So if you have 
30 children and only 20 show up. Uh, right now they're only getting compensated for 20, but they still have to have the lights on. They still have the same number of teachers. They still have to prepare the school lunches. They don't know who's going to show up on a given day. They have to have a business model that works. And so we have to start solving the issues there from a state perspective and assisting uh, the, the entire system to, uh, to work. So this is a, a crisis and it all goes back up. So I'm going to be the education governor. I'm going to solve the situation by prioritizing education starting at the earliest ages working all the way through. Uh, I love what I see when I'm out there at the high schools right now. Uh, the governor's uh, wife, the first lady, has done this uh, uh, comfort dog situation. I've seen that in schools, and it works. The kids love these dogs. And so those sorts of things, the uh, security officers that are there that are walking around on a, uh, on a routine basis, we've got some good things going on in this state, but we need to prioritize it and fund it to make it all work. Chairman Capito, you need the question again? I've got it. Thank you so all much. All right. I appreciate it. So, you know, number one, you know, with this crisis, uh, what really underpins a lot of the problems that we're seeing um, with our with our youth and the difficulties and the obstacles is the drug crisis. Most all of it is related to that. And you'll notice that there's one candidate that's not here today, Patrick Morrissey, because he has a clear history of siding with big pharmaceutical companies that he represented for years, that he made millions of dollars from instead of the people of West Virginia, that he sold short in a settlement deal that left the people of West Virginia on the short end of the stick. So we need to get back to recovery with folks that are focused on West Virginia, which he is not. That's number one. Number two, we have to ensure that our CPS workers are getting the last call and not the first call. And so what does that mean? When we have trouble in the household, we need to make sure that we have preventative services that our folks in the community are educated about so they know who to contact on that first call. A perfect example of that is what's going on right here in the Eastern Panhandle with the Martinsburg Initiative. That is a collaborative effort between uh, community leaders, law enforcement, faith-based organizations to provide a preventative service call for those families in that first instance. So what does that do? That creates an opportunity for that first call to be made to Martinsburg Initiative in this example, which frees up more casework for our CPS workers so that they are ultimately the last call. All right. Second question, John. Access to health care in some parts of the state uh, can be difficult. Some say the certificates of need restrict access to health care and we rank at the bottom of the health care statistics here in West Virginia. But health care providers maintain that certificates of need are necessary in order to provide any health care at all. Where do you stand on certificates of need? And I believe we are starting with Chairman Capito. Yeah, so I believe we have to expand health care opportunities. There's no question. I mean, you know, I was uh, in Buchanan a couple weeks ago talking to community care, discussing all of the, the efforts that they are putting through right now. Uh, in, in our rural areas, uh, rural health, and I was meeting with the, the head of our Rome County Hospital to talk about some of the issues that are going on there. Um, you know, a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now is that uh, is, is the pay mix. We don't have, uh, we have issues with our insurance that are going into our health care facilities, and it's, it's sort of degrading the quality of health care that we're able to provide. Um, I have voted in favor of reducing some of those barriers so that we can ensure that more health care uh, providers uh, get into the space and lower the cost of those uh, services to West Virginians. We certainly need more health care, not less. When we talk about all of the things that we've talked about today, whether it's what's going on in our child, uh, you know, the child care crisis, the economy, education, all of it relates to health care. And if we want to ensure that we have strong, uh, stronger children that are able to learn better and contribute ultimately into our communities, we have to make sure that they're healthy. Is that a yes on certificate of need or a no? <laughs> on do I support? Or certificate no? of need, yes. Well, we've taken a balanced approach to it. I've voted, I've voted to repeal parts of it to make sure that we can get more rural health. Absolutely. Fair enough. So we're first place in obesity, first place in heart attacks, first place in diabetes rates, first place in cancer rates. 
our health care right now isn't doing a very good job of keeping us healthy. That's for darn sure. Now, we've got rural spots all around the state that don't have access to good health care either. The certificate of need question is a very good one because any time throughout history you deal with controlled competition, you wind up with a system that doesn't provide enough services to the taxpayer or to the marketplace. And that's what certificate of need does. It creates smaller markets with government control that allows these certain entities to sit around and make a lot of money at the expense of our health, at the expense of our services, at the expense of our access to health care. Now, the health care question is interesting because I'm a farmer, right? And part of health care has to do with access to good, nutritious food. West Virginia can produce lots of good produce, lots of good livestock. And one of the other things that we need to do to make sure that we have a next generation of kids that are moving through our school system and into our workforce that are healthy, to make sure they don't have heart disease issues, to make sure they don't have diabetes, to make sure that they don't have obesity issues, is to provide better nutrition from our farmers to our school systems to make sure that everybody has access to good quality nourishment. So the health care question is a fascinating one because we are dead last in just about everything. And we need to fix that. And we need to do that by embracing the free market, embracing competition, and making sure that there are resources that are provided to everyone in a market-based economy. I'll take that as a no then. Yeah. All right. I know people like a yes and no answer. But at the outset, I said I'm trained to, to see both sides. I've been both a prosecutor and a defense counsel. And so this certificate of need can go into that category, such as vaccinations, such as abortion. Such, there are all kinds of issues. And that's why they remain political hot, uh, hot potatoes. I, I would be for getting rid of the certificate of need. But I want to be careful, just like uh, more Capito said here, of not going too, fa too far too, too quickly. And I, I'm going to make an analogy to the school choice situation. The public schools are concerned that with the school choice, charter schools, private schools, that sort of thing, it's going to detract from uh, the, the public education. And we have, to be, we have to watch for that. But at least the state has gone down the path of saying, let's open a, the, the door and see how it's going. And so far, I think it's going along very well. So I'd be willing to reduce the restrictions on the certificate of need. Competition is good. But what I have heard from people is saying that you open that up and you're going to have out-of-state companies coming in around the borders, cherry-picking the easy stuff, the high-money stuff, and then that's going to hurt the rest of the uh, health care, care system. And I don't want the rest of West Virginia to suffer because of the cherry-picking around the edges. So this is one we have to go down to a balanced approach again. I think that uh, uh, more Capito had a good uh, answer on that one. And we have to approach it carefully. So I'd be willing to loosen it, but I don't want to just open it up for a free market where we hurt the rest of the health care in the state. Thank you, gentlemen. Now on to topic number four for that, Bill Stubblefield. And I think, Mr. I think I believe you have the first, uh, answer to this, Mr. Miller. Some say that the flatline budget has served the state well, but others say at the expense of certain needed programs. Would you continue the flatline budget? So having a wife that's in education, watching what happens with the operation of government, one of the things that we always miss is efficiency. So everybody gets a budget, and then they, have, they scramble to spend everything they've got in their budget, which is wasting taxpayer dollars, because if they don't do that, they don't get the same amount of money next year. The system's wrong. What we should be doing is providing incentives to make sure that the people running government are actually doing a good job with it. So there should be a budget, and then what they don't spend out of that budget, part of it should go to bonuses to people inside of that department to reward them for managing our tax dollars appropriately. So I would actually one up that and go to that route and make sure that we're utilizing the dollars that are taxpayer money in a better way and rewarding people for saving tax dollars, not rewarding them for spending them. Mr. Warner? I'm a Republican, and Republicans are for less taxes, balanced budgets, that sort of a approach to smaller government, and, and that's where we're going to, to go. With a, with, there's nothing wrong with a flat budget as long as you're providing the services that are needed uh, throughout the state. And as we've talked before, when you have teacher shortages, uh, correction shortages, that sort of thing, we've got a problem with priorities or prioritization. So I'm for a, a balanced budget. We need to reduce taxes wherever possible, but it has to be on a step-by-step -step basis. I think this legislature is doing a good job uh, approaching this from an adult perspective of saying we're going to reduce taxes when we hit certain uh, check marks, and, and we're doing a good job with that right now. Mr. Capito? Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I remember in, in 2017 uh, when I first came into the legislature, we were looking at a $500 million deficit in the state of West Virginia, and we were looking – to see how we could really institute our conservative uh, principles 
to the budgeting process in West Virginia that had been controlled by Democrats for 83 to 84 years. And as Republicans, that's exactly what we did. I was very proud to help lead on creating a budget that we knew could sustain uh, through, you know, for the next six to seven years. And when you fast forward and seven years later, we were looking at a $2 billion surplus in the state of West Virginia. I can tell you that there were many a times on that floor that uh, folks wanted to base build on that budget. But as conservatives, we fought back those efforts because we knew that a flatline budget was ultimately how we were going to grow. Efficiency is critical when you look at the budget. The government is obviously bloated. There are places that we can look, whether it's the size of certain departments, unfilled positions, we don't talk about that enough, in the budget where we're just simply putting money into accounts that are never swept. So as governor, we will absolutely take an eye at every single one of those opportunities where we have to sweep more monies and be more efficient with the people's tax dollars. Uh, but what we have to ensure that we're doing is we're always looking to lessen the burden on everyday West Virginians. And I was very proud to do that in the largest tax cut in the history of the state. We will accelerate that so we completely get rid of it. Question number two, Bill. Uh, this will go to Mr. Warner first. What value do you view candidate forums and debates? If a candidate chooses not to participate, does his or her absence significantly weaken the effectiveness of the forum or debate? And try to cap your answers at about 60 seconds on this one. Absolutely. They degrade the whole process. The people need to be able to look at the candidates, hear the candidates, uh, and be able to ask them questions. And so now there's a little difference. A debate allows you to, to do a little crossfire. Today's is, is a forum, and so this is great to get out policy issues and so forth. But a debate is very helpful as well because then you can actually uh, – some of these ads that you've seen out here, they're, they, it's gotten a little ugly here in this campaign. And we need to, be, need to be able to push back as to what's true, what's not true, and then ask the difficult questions. You all are asking some great questions, but some of these aren't necessarily the difficult questions that address a candidate who is not here. Uh, and so I'm all in favor. I, I want to debate anytime, anywhere. Thank you. Mr. Capito? As I mentioned earlier, you know, I've, I've driven over 85,000 miles across this state because I firmly believe that the solutions uh, to the challenges that we face in the state of West Virginia are with the people. And the only way that you're going to find those solutions is by listening. You know, you can talk to anybody that's ever worked with me and I think they'll tell you the same thing. Number one is that I'm a listener and I'm a doer. And I prefer to have those conversations every single day across this state face to face with West Virginians. You can't have every single one and you can't see every West Virginian. Some candidates like to have that conversation through the mailbox. But I'm a firm believer that West Virginians want to know their governor. They want to see their governor if they're going to trust their governor. And that's why we've spent every single day speaking and listening to as many West Virginians as we can. And forums like this are an opportunity, especially in a place like the Eastern Panhandle, which is thriving, to hear from a governor that you know is going to be on the ground, that's going to spend time here, and is committed to this state. Mr. Miller. So being a business guy and an outsider, here's an absolute shocker for everybody out there. Elections are always about the people. It's not about the political class. And so any time you have a chance to communicate with the people to show what your thoughts are, that you should be jumping on that immediately. It's very, very disrespectful to the taxpayer and to the voter not to show up to be able to be compared to everybody else. And the best part about our state, by the way, are the people. I mean, it's only in West Virginia that people will bring you into their house and feed you even when they don't have a lot. And it's also only in West Virginia when your Tesla breaks down out in coal country <laughs> will a bunch of miners come out of the mine, push your Tesla to a coal power generator to make sure that you got enough charge to get on down the road. That's our people in West Virginia. They're the best people on planet Earth. <laughs> and not showing up to a debate to be able to interact with the other people that you're running with is completely and utterly disrespectful to the taxpayer, to the voter, and they should be looked at as shareholders of the state. And right now, the political class doesn't like that. They don't want to realize that the taxpayer should have all the power, and they should. It's almost like he was following you down that country <laughs> road. <laughs> yeah, I was with you, uh, Mr. Mellon, until you mentioned the Tesla. <laughs> oh, that's a whole separate conversation. Bill has a Tesla. I don't know if you know that. Uh, fully subsidized yeah. piece yeah. of equipment. <laughs> All right, it's time for uh, closing statements now, and you'll each get uh, two full minutes uh, since we started with Secretary Warner. We'll do with the closings, uh, rotating over toward Chairman Capito. 
Thank you very much, and it's great to be here. It's great to be back in the EP. We have been here a ton. It's great to be back with, with you folks, and we will be back again. Uh, this is a great discussion on many of the issues that are critically important to the state of West Virginia. And as I said, I'm more Capito. I'm a lifelong West Virginian. I'm the father of two young kids. And the future of this state is personal to me. And I always say it, and I'll say it again, and it's personal to every single West Virginian. And we have spent the last 16 to 17 months crisscrossing this beautiful state, listening to West Virginians everywhere, parents, educators, community leaders, faith leaders, and business leaders, to find out how we grow West Virginia. I'm a listener and I'm a doer. I have a track record of showing my ability to bring people together, to build relationships, to solve the issues of tomorrow. I got a question the other day at Sissonville High School from a young lady that was interested in civics class. And she said, what is the biggest issue that we face in West Virginia? And I said, how much time do you have? And I told her very simply, we don't know how great we are in West Virginia. We have a story to tell. And for far too long, our narrative has been controlled by individuals that live outside of this boundary. And as a lifelong West Virginian, I will tell the story that we all know it to be. A story of hope, a story of grit, and a story of determination to take this state into the 21st century with a bang. I'm asking for your trust, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you very much. Mr. Miller. So like President Trump, I'm a business guy. And if you think about what a governor is, he's the CEO of the state. And his job is to solve problems and report to the taxpayer, who technically speaking should be looked at as a shareholder. Our state, we've got problems. We're dead last in just about everything from economy to education. The only thing we're really first in is the number of the grandparents raising grandchildren. We also have this incestuous good old boy system that's been running our state for far too long that gets in the way of actually providing progress and tangible products to the taxpayers. We also, our greatest export right now is not our coal or our natural gas. Our greatest export is our kids. And we have to solve that problem now because that's the biggest problem that we face. The good news is there's solutions. First thing we have to do is run state government more like a business, audit every single dime that we spend, and create an economy that thrives. We also need to kick wokeism completely and utterly out of our school systems. There's too much of an infiltration of that from the Department of Education. And I have an 11 year old daughter. I don't want her sharing a bathroom with a biological male. It's a non starter. Plus, we need to get rid of special interest. We need to kick it completely and utterly out of the governor's administration to make sure that the special interest is not influencing what happens deal wise inside of the state of West Virginia. Now, our people, we're struggling for what I call a little bit of PTSD. We don't realize how great we have been. Our people mined the coal that built the steel that led to a victory in World War I. And we mined the coal that built the steel that led to a victory in World War II. And we mined the coal that led to the cheap energy and the greatest capitalistic expansion in human history. We did that. We're capable of doing huge things. And right now, West Virginia has what the rest of the world needs, the ability to produce massive amounts of energy, coal, natural gas, an incredible amount of water, rare earth elements, plus more geothermal power than Saudi Arabia can generate and BTUs and natural gas. And when you add all that stuff up, we can cut the cost of power by 70% and use that as the foundation of all of our economic growth and development. My name's Chris Miller, and it would be the honor of my lifetime to be chosen as the next governor of the great state of West by God, Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Secretary Warner. I've bristled at those who say that we don't know how great we are or uh, that this we're just now with the current politicians discovering how great West Virginia is and we need to so we've been great all along we have this great history one question you didn't didn't ask was tourism think about what we've got just right here in the eastern panhandle from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln to uh, Harpers Ferry and Charlestown and what happened with uh, people from Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee uh, Jeb Stewart all part of this history right here we simply want to go tell it to the world this tourism can bring a lot of economy uh, to this state. I love West Virginia history. I love West Virginia. I love the people of West Virginia. That's why I want to be the governor of West Virginia. I don't want to be a U.S. senator. I'm not running for this position to go take Shelley Moore Capito's seat in 26 or to appoint myself to senator. I want to be the governor of the state of West Virginia. My wife Debbie and I are going to live in the governor's mansion. We're going to go to work. I'll be the first to work every morning, the last to leave every night. 
To whom much has been given, much is expected. I've been given much in this life, and I want to give back to the people of West Virginia, use this vast amount of experience I've had from traveling all over the world to a military career, to a legal profession. I've been given all this by the people of West Virginia and the United States of America, and this is my chance to give back to the uh, people of West Virginia. This will be the pinnacle of my career. I'm asking uh, for people's support, for your vote. My name is Mac Warner, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk to the people of West Virginia today. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for being here today and for sticking to the time limits, too. We made it right on time. Well done. Uh, to all of you uh, watching and listening and uh, to those of you who maybe were only on the radio side and would like to watch this later, this uh, entire broadcast is being streamed live on Facebook. The entire broadcast is archived there each day. Individually, we'll cut up each of these races, and they'll be on our WNR TV YouTube page in perpetuity, so you can go back and watch any individual segments that you wanted to watch as well. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much. We wish you all the best of luck in the upcoming election. Thank you. Thank you very Secretary much. Secretary Warner, Chairman Capito, Mr. Miller, thank you so much. Thanks. We are back with a look at the Sheriff's Department races coming up right after this. Great job. Providing reliable protection since 1877, we are Farmers and Mechanic Insurance Companies. For over a century, we have been dedicated to provide dependable insurance protection and excellent customer service. We specialize in auto, 